as we premiere Solo Arts Heal Climate, where once a month we want to present both performance and informants on climate change to which our health and all environmental issues are connected. We're all grateful to be part of the bar stream at the forefront of live streaming these shows among your so many new and, and seasoned performers. As we have tonight for um, you with our featured guest, Timothy Mooney, uh, with excerpts from his show, Man Cave, a one man sci-fi climate change tragicomedy. Along with a stirring rallying cry for saving the planet, Man Cave walks the line that drips with both irony and edgy gallows humor. Tim will show us shortly for his performance and, um, and our talk back on five really important questions about climate change. Today, we know climate disruption is the biggest challenge humanity has ever faced. Um, just recently, uh, the torrential rains in China caused $3 billion in damage, leaving many dead and missing. And in fact, uh, we've had $15 billion weather disasters globally so far in 2020. And the Saharan dust cloud was the most intense in decades, and massive dust storm caused unhealthy air pollution across much of the southeastern United States. Uh, and the tropical storm, their fifth tropical storm, usually we don't get until August 31st. Well, it already is upon us, tropical storm Edward. And intense Arctic wildfires are setting a pollution record. So with glaciers melting and seas rising and 16 of the 17 hottest years on record coming this century, we know humanity must change and act boldly to solve the climate crisis. The good news is that we know we can. Solar, wind, and other renewable solutions are becoming more affordable every year. And all around the world, countries from China to Chile are seizing the moment, working to cut emissions under the Paris Agreement and create a safe, sustainable, and prosperous future powered by clean energy. Um, oddly enough, since the pandemic, the skies have never been, haven't been clearer in, in decades. The air is cleaner and we think it's the perfect time for Solo Arts Heal Climate, which like all our shows are gifts to the communities we share by offering information and inspiration for your empowerment and advocacy through presenting outstanding talent and in talks backs with guests in our audience about varied health issues, um, including the health emergency of climate change. I just finished a six part webinar on this very topic at UCSF. All are issues related to our own health and caregiving for our mother earth. So tonight as on All Solar Arts Heal Nights, um, we come together for peace and healing as we embrace the healing power of the arts because it's through the arts that we find the truth of our shared humanity in all its drama and its humor, laughter is good medicine, which we share tonight with Timothy Mooney, performing excerpts from his play, Man Cave, a one-man sci-fi climate change tragicomedy. Here's the setup. As Man Cave opens, we meet Tim, Tim is both our performer and the character's name, who may or may not be the last man on earth. Of course, whomever may actually one day be the last man on earth will probably have no independent way of verifying that fact. And so Tim has taken to reaching out through the internet and the airwaves to find whatever semblance of human or other contact might yet be discovered, all the while arguing with himself about just how we all manage to get ourselves into this. Over time, the internet, which somehow seems to remain operational, fails to offer any hope for response with no changes to the formerly active websites and no hint of the long awaited ding to signal an incoming email. So gradually Tim turns his attention from the hope for responses from Sweden or New Zealand and realizing that his broadcast signal is ultimately traveling out into space, finds himself wondering if and how his thoughts may be received by alien ears at some ultimate destination. So now, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming with live excerpts from his solo show, Man Cave, Timothy Mooney. Yes, God gave us oil. Or God gave us trees that got squeezed down into oil. Or God gave us fungus that turned into trees. But if we're going to pass the responsibility over to God, then well, well, then God did also give us brains and logical thinking and ultimately science 
And while it was science to some degree, along with the oil and engine that got us into this mess, it was also science that showed us the impact that shit was having on air, climate, temperature. We loved and embraced certain aspects of science that pleased and served us. We reject other aspects that threaten to take our goodies away. Year in, year out, earth in, earth out, is this a cycle? Will each evolving species come to the same conclusion, or is it possible for maturity to outrace technology? How many infant sentient species were there out there that never made it past that first year as toddler? How many are out there now toddling along? How many have been listening to this odd stream of radio waves coming from Earth over the past century? Did you get bored and stop listening? Did you listen long enough to figure out there was some kind of language there? Are you listening now? On the off chance that you're listening now, or are perhaps recording this as some odd stream of bleeps and gloops that you will play back and translate later, I bleed my words into the abyss. What do you think these noises are? Are they God to you? Does God speak to you in bleeps? <laughs> Probably not if you've been watching American television in the last 30 years. Okay, the God thing. Yeah, all right, let's go with that. This is God speaking. Let me think of some commandments. Okay, here's one, air conditioning. Whatever planet you grew up on, you evolved into a thinking species without air conditioning. Your planet is, by definition, habitable. Work with it. The impulse to terraform your planet threatens an immeasurable number of species upon whose shoulders you stand far more precariously than you might possibly imagine. <laughs> and I say this as someone who, A, hates spiders, and B, will likely be dead within 24 hours of his air cutting out. Commandment two. Stop idling. We drew up laws against idling in our last couple of years. I, I don't mean laziness, though, of course there's that. Uh, there came a time when it be became impossible to travel anywhere outdoors without driving while running the air conditioner. But when people arrived at their destination, they couldn't bring themselves to turn that air conditioning off. And so they idled running the most expensive air conditioner ever developed, belching tons of carbon into the air, all for the sake of cooling down a few cubic feet of space. <laughs> Towards the end, people were getting torn from their cars, but by that time, you get the idea. Uh, commandment three, do not get too attached to any given form of technology. Just because you can use it and might do it doesn't mean that you ought to. The average round trip trans ocean flight leaves a carbon footprint, roughly equivalent to driving the average car through the course of the average year per passenger. Eliminating air travel altogether would have been the equivalent of taking like a million cars off of the road per day. But <laughs> We Pandora'd air travel out of the box and never even thought about putting it back in. We spent centuries yearning to be as free as birds and the occasional cavity search for the privilege of sitting in a narrow aluminum tube with liquids of no more than three ounces was just about as close as we were gonna get. But once we had it, and lo, there came upon them the vision of the hockey stick. Um, not a commandment, just um, God talking. Somewhere around the turn of the millennium, somebody noticed that the graph of temperatures was oddly reminiscent of a hockey stick, a long, long, long steady decline reaching back over like 10,000 years, followed by a sudden swoop upwards, initiating around the Industrial Revolution, but never widely noticed or articulated until the 21st century, at which point we all kind of looked at it and said, huh, yep, that's a, that's a warming trend. We thought we had more time because it was a hockey stick. It angled down and it angled up. It was an angle. People argued about the meaning of the angle. Some denied it, but it was still an angle. We had time to make a change, to adjust our behavior, to wean our way ever so gradually off of the stuff starting like 
first thing tomorrow. We didn't count on that angle uh, continuing to curve, continuing to accelerate, shifting from an angle into a, a plane. An exponential growth of anything never looks like much at first, but then it builds up quite suddenly. Things don't happen in isolation. Things affect other things, and the other things change. And the changed things impact the first things, making them worse. And the worst things impact the second things, making them terrible. And we hit the wall. In our case, the second thing was the methane. Uh, am I getting too technical with it all? Maybe I should just stop with things affect other th Okay, well, quickly. Uh, we all knew about carbon. It was clouding the air, creating the greenhouse effect, trapping heat, driving up temperatures. It's a bitch. And with the rising temperatures, stuff started to melt. We all knew that it would swell the ocean and wreck the coastline and all that happened. Slow at first and then kind of fast. But along with the icebergs and the glaciers, there was also the permafrost. Stuff that hadn't melted in maybe 10,000 years was now melting in the course of about 10 years all at once, releasing methane. Yes, farts, shit, gas, bacteria, stuff that had been trapped in the permafrost, which was now no longer anywhere near so perma as it had been cracked up to be. <laughs> Turns out methane heats stuff up even more. More ice melts, less light is reflected away from where ice once was, which generates more heat and sets off a seemingly unending series of forest fires, which kick even more carbon into the air, all the while eradicating carbon-reducing, oxygen-producing plant life. Suddenly, lands that used to be able to bear crops are now drier than the Dust Bowl, hitting us with starvation, famine, sudden spikes of migration, spikes that are redoubled by the rising sea level, which given that 10% of the world population used to live within 30 feet of sea level, and don't get me started on the way we planted and abandoned nuclear facilities right there on the shoreline, sets off a secondary flood, this one of refugees. And as if that were not enough, the melting permafrost sets free the mothers of all ancient diseases, which now, like Captain America, are back in the game, hitting us with anthrax, bubonic plague, stuff that I'd never even heard of and still can't pronounce, financial collapse, and the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Each and every individual thing impacts each and every part of every other thing, which in turn recranks up the original thing. It's a feedback loop. But for those of us who still can, just blast the air conditioning, leave the car running, keep flying, jack up the shit that was making the problem bad in the first place, and hold off the refugees as long as you possibly can. And shit gets worse and wars break out like overnight. And the blood of English shall manure the ground. Things affect other things. A bedtime story. Shit, 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 fuck, fuck, fuck. Shut up, shut up, shut up. Hey, sorry, shake it off. Is it possible? Is it rational? Is it in any way meaningful to fight on behalf of a people you've never met, will never meet, maybe, probably don't exist? I know, I know, I know, they're not people. They're, let's say, intelligent life. Well, anyway, if not that, then what meaning can there possibly be? Commandment four, the cost of buying a thing needs to reflect the expense it inflicts on the planet at large. There once was a time a gallon of gas was less than a dollar. I still remember when it was still less than two dollars, but that one or two dollars only reflects the expense of extracting it out of the ground, the pumps and the pipes, the transport, the ads, and the lobbyists, lawyers. Turns out that for each single dollar's extraction was another, say, two bucks impact on the planet, just guessing, we were spending a trillion or more every year on the gas. Two trillion a year should have gone into wetlands, renewables, recyclables, trees, planet infrastructure. We learned all of this on a personal scale. When we finally got cigarettes were a poison, we just 
tax the shit out of it, nowhere near enough to quite compensate, but most of those people were now dead already. So then did we tax that $1 of gas? <laughs> no, we subsidized it. We dropped down the cost of that dollar's extraction to just about 85 cents. The richest of companies yet known to man now paid out near zero in taxes. We collectively said, hey, we need all this shit to survive and succeed. And these bastions of commerce are risking their assets for precious elixirs that make our things go. They must be underwritten. Let us give them great grants and rewards, the shiniest medals for making the wheels of our industry turn as they churn rich black smoke on out into the air. Which brings up number five. Those who make up your laws must not profit therein. Because each single time they will bow to that magic elixir of profit far more than that vague and uncertain voodoo that your eggheads call science, forcing the three trillion cost of your gas on down to a most unsustainable one. Side note, still God here, so listen. Money is not a thing. It's a concept which we bring in to stand for those things we could have if only we just had the money. And those things themselves are not things. They are representations of joy we have lost, love we have lost, the creative spark that has gone out on us. If I have enough things, I can fly through the air or race in my car against time till those feelings return. Love, joy, sparks, tingles, those lost moments from back in the day when I used to deserve. Still waiting on that ding anytime anyone might well wanna weigh in. Really? Uh, Sweden? New Zealand? There's somebody there in New Zealand, right? Okay, well then, Proxima Centauri, or Termina Centauri, or someplace in between. My voice goes out and you'll hear it in what? 30 years, 3,000 or so? And then you'll talk back. And 60, 6,000 years from this tick, you'll talk to a very hot planet in your unique accent in your own special diction. Of course, I won't be here, nobody will, and you'll have learned English for no good reason. Unless maybe you managed to download some Shakespeare. But the planet itself won't be dead. Sure, the roads will all crumble, the buildings collapse, the, the plastic, that'll, that'll still be around. And maybe the last living things to survive will be cockroaches and some fungi. You might find yourself talking to some really fun guy. Sorry. It'll all go to shit for a time, but a thousand years more, maybe a million, the earth has a cleanse. It rains and it buries its carbon below once again. And B, skyscrapers form some new form of bedrock and the fun guys form life, or the lizards form brains, become Klingons. And then you'll have someone to talk to from here, except they'll speak Klingon. And it won't that much matter because they'll all have sprung from primordial ooze and won't reti retain even the tiniest fraction of the institutional memory I have with me now. You could, if you wanted catch them up on things. So this is one way, as much as you might find you want to respond to someone quite so charismatic as me, by the time you reply, I just won't be all that much into you then. So maybe just listen. I'm no kind of genius, just the last one to witness to stuff not quite costing as much as it probably ought cross-reference to rule number four. So, sex. Sex was kind of important to us, probably is to you too. It tingles, feels good, 
and you want to repeat what feels good, so you relive the success of your sex in successive conceptions. If it don't feel so good, then you're not so inspired to reseed the species and your special branch of the prolific process simply won't stretch itself out so far. But for us, it was good. Really good. I remember it. Still engage in it from time to time. Not quite in a way you might quite call productive, but boy, were we productive and our sudden explosion of reproductive matter outstretched or edged out all the stuff gone before us. We toddled along a really long time with maybe a million till that whole, you know, farming thing kind of took off. We hit a slight snag around 1300 with the bubonic plague, but figured out a little something about hygiene and got back to work. We hit our first billion around 1800. Number two, 1930, and then 1960, and 75, 1990, 2000, 2010, 2020. In just 60 years, we tacked on 5 billion to double and triple the cumulative output of 300,000 long years as a species. The sex was, yeah, good without precedent. We were only just guessing that we could sustain at this pace. We were a great throng of sex-starved adolescents, making all of it up as we toddled along. Extra billion? Why not? Never mind, at the same time we're using, well, food. Uh, we made up this sudden new craving for gas, for electric, for power. We needed it, craved it. It got us to shelter. It got us more comfort. It got us more sex. Some countries encouraged their folks reproduce. It provided protection from other states, other kinds, that great horde of those swarthy barbarians. And then we again put our words in God's mouth, be fruitful and multiply. And there for a little brief time that paid off until, well, it didn't. So rule number six, don't get over your skis, expanding to unheard of numbers the same time demand has run multiple laps blowing past all the output of all time gone by. Sure, easy for me to say, boy, when I was your age, I was some raconteur, which is great. Share affection and love, just don't multiply as if it were a race, cause to coin a phrase, that's a race to the bottom. More ways than one. So, speaking of races, at each stage of the game, you find that you're faced with illusion of some competition. It's us against those that are not blessed by God or us against the barbarians. It's us against the spotted owl. It's us against the Zika virus. Okay, maybe that one, but on the whole, not. We came to this random conclusion. We were caught up in some competition. If I climb the ladder, I have the advantage and fill up my pockets with money, which now is worth nothing, and pull up the ladder behind me. There was, once a time, things were random. A roll of the dice, where each roll might come up one through six, but we started to roll most all sixes. More often than not, each year, hotter than that gone before. And, and we'd still roll a four or a five, so some would say, see, random, not man, it was God. <laughs> of course, that assumes it was God rolling lower for us and not simply smiting our sins of excess with his sixes. And we'd roll one more six and another, except now those sixes were closer to twelves and we left any semblance of random behind in the unspoken pact to never acknowledge the screamingly impossible improbabilities. Seven, acknowledge screamingly impossible improbability. We grew brains over eons, forged a language or Two, developed statistical analysis, if only so that, you know, the insurance companies could figure out how much to charge us. Th there was that time people seemed to forget the principal point of insurance. They famously said, our healthiest people are stuck paying out for the sick. 
that should have been a clue that all we had left was the ongoing struggle for privilege. We were all of us grabbing for stuff off the beverage cart in the few final moments before the airplane would crash to the ground, acquiring more stuff in the desperate race to fill that black hole, which was now all we had left inside. Everybody kicks in, each one loses a little, and no one gets thrown off the ship we apply that principle to owls and bees and coral reefs. Each one arrives. We'll make that number eight. Okay, here's the thing. I'm kidding myself. I talk to a you that I'll never know, broadcast to a planet that lives in my brain. And even if there might yet be some you in some state of awareness on some somehow survivable planet out there, even if you're out there, the chance I catch you in the brief microsecond of geo astrophysical time in which you're equipped to catch radio waves but haven't as yet wiped yourselves off the map are maybe a billion to one. And yet, microscopic as those odds might be, they are not yet zero. And as far away as you are, maybe me sitting here working through all this shit on some empty planet with no one to hear, at least stirs a shift here in me. And maybe my shift in some way, somehow, somewhere is felt, say, Tralfamador, that planet so far and so very much different from me. And perhaps that far corner, that ugly, unrecognizable race of Tralfamadorians somehow is me, is connected by some not yet knowable thread. A thread as unknowable to me here now as radio waves were 200 years past or not, likely not. Number nine, corporations are made up of people, my friend, but cannot be people. A robot may well be no part human being, but robots can't consciously injure a human or through some inaction allow that a human might so come to harm. Corporations must act to maximize profit or otherwise risk getting sued by investors. It was under this guise corporations had hid what they were well aware would heat up the planet and leave it a wasteland. So, which of these two would you call Terminator? Which one of these is more like people, my friend? Which of these has the freedom to obey the commandment to do unto others as you would have them likewise do unto you. And scene. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. <laughs> That's such a fantastic scene at the whole thing. I really appreciate it. There, there's, there's so much to talk about here, including your prescience in the play when you talk about permafrost related diseases as the world sits in submission to COVID and the cost of buying a thing, the a lifestyle, um, the, the uh, life cycle analysis of products. Um, your passion is palpable. And I must say, I know this to be true because you showcase two shows with us at APAP, um, Man Cave, and Breakneck Julius Caesar. So I'd, before we get into our, our climate talk, I'd love to hear about some of your other shows. How many do you have now? Eight? I have eight that I'm doing on a regular basis. Actually, I'm performing from home now, uh, given uh, our current situation. And I'm doing a different show every week for a cycle of eight weeks on Sunday and Monday nights. And then I start over at the top and, and run through them all again. Great, great. Um, I know that uh, Brian, our, our producer, is going to be posting um, your links in the chat. Yeah. And so people will be able to see all of your different shows. Um, what you, you have, um, uh, uh, tell, tell us about, you have Breakneck Julius Caesar and- yeah, I, have, 
I have four different Shakespeare one-man plays. I have Lotto Shakespeare, which is one monologue from every Shakespeare play determined entirely at random based on the spin of a bingo cage. I have, uh, I then created Shakespeare's History's 10 epic plays at a breakneck pace, all 10 history plays in just one hour. Breakneck Hamlet, all of Hamlet in just one hour. Breakneck Julius Caesar, all of Julius Caesar in one hour. And then uh, these all sprang, my very first one-man play was something called Moliere Than Thou, which is uh, Moliere's cast has all come down with food poisoning. He doesn't want, want to refund the audience's money. And so instead he offers to pro perform a series of his favorite monologues. And so those are my five classical pieces. I do also do a collection of great speeches called The Greatest Speech of All Time. Uh, this one, Man Cave, a one-man sci-fi, climate change, tragic comedy, and my latest is a, it's actually kind of a keynote address uh, called Lost at Santa's Village, about 50 years of uh, working on theater. Oh, that's great. That's great. And your and your um, the greatest speeches of all time. You have actual historical speeches from Socrates and Martin Luther King and exactly from starts with we go through we we do a quick w rip through time from Socrates to Mark Antony, Frederick Douglass, Abraham Lincoln, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, I think somewhere in there I squeeze. There's there's a couple of new ones I'm squeezing in, including Dwight Eisenhower and Emma Goldman and Winston Churchill and Martin Luther King. Oh, fantastic. I really wouldn't want to see that. And you're also an author of a new acting textbook, Acting at the Speed of Life, Conquering Theatrical Style, and the Big Book of Moliere Monologues. And you've given over 100,000 students their first introduction to Moliere through your uh, one-man play, Moliere Than Thou. Well, I've been on tour doing one-man plays for 20 years now. And I started out with Moliere than Thou, and for a while that was the only one I was doing, and now I'm carrying about eight plays along with me. But, and if this would make a nice segue for us, I think, um, with all the miles that I was putting on the highway, driving about 40,000 miles around the country every year, I was feeling a greater and greater um, kind of guilt complex about just how much carbon I was pouring out into the air in the process of doing that. And uh, but it was in 2017, I got inspired by another uh, fringe actor's performance of a one-man climate play uh, that got me excited about taking on the climate and, and maybe, maybe uh, doing some penance for all of that carbon that I'd poured out into the air. And so that's, that was the genesis of Man Cave, a one-man sci-fi climate change tragic comedy. Awesome. That's great. I know Global News Canada said even the most skeptical among us can't help but hear the truth and the passion of this all too close to home story of impending doom. Yeah. Um, so, so let's uh, get into Man Cave. Um, first, I do want to um, remind the audience that posted in the chat is the tip jar, if, or it will be, if not already. And um, the Marsh receives 70% uh, of its funding through ticket sales. And since there are no ticket sales, any support you're able to give is much appreciated. Also, we encourage questions. We have a new format uh, now, and um, the audience uh, but the audience can still post and, and uh, questions in the chat, and we want to answer many of those as we can. Um, and uh, Brian Williamson and our production, his production assistant, Brianna, will help us keep an eye on that. So anyway, um, back to Man Cave, which I believe you developed in 2017, you said? Yes. How, how did you come to, con so you just told us actually how you came to conceive this play um, through seeing another play. Right. Um, uh, an actor by the name of Dan Kinch was doing a play about um, near-term human extinction. Uh, but he was doing it from kind of as a lecture comic routine, standing in the present and looking ahead towards the future. And when I, when I saw it, I, I, I loved his message, but I could feel people who were um, resistant in the room. They were, they were confident that we have another 50 years, another 100 years before we even have to worry about it. And so I thought that it would be good to try the reverse, to stand in the future, looking back at the past and questioning how we got here. So that people tend to accept my circumstances for whatever they are as they observe them in action, you know, in what is to me the present tense. And then they're curious about, gee, what were all the mistakes that we made along the way? So I thought I would try to tell that story. You sure have. And I, I wish I they hadn't said that um, your setup there is the conceit is that you're in a bunker, a hobbit 
a, a hobbit home, right? A bunker. Kind of a hobbit condo under, under a hill somewhere. Under a hill Surround, somewhere. Surrounded by uh, solar panels, which is giving me my lone so source of electricity and with maybe a radio tower somewhere on the top of the hill. So I guess kind of what we're going to be doing on Mars, you know, there's a whole mission to Mars uh, uh, happening. So, um, you know, underground, bring, bring air. <laughs> anyway, um, I want to um, ask you, we're talking about our five questions about climate change. And, um, and one of the things is how, how are we affected with this with COVID-19? Mm -hmm. And um, well, I, I, of course, I wrote this, you know, two years before COVID-19 uh, ever uh, popped its head over, over the ridge. And uh, I, I've just, I, I've probably performed it 40, 50 times now, but it wasn't until um, in March, I was out in Fresno doing the Rogue Theater Festival. And it's a two weekend festival. And the first weekend there were uh, uh, generous audiences responding, laughing, getting into it, enjoying it. Um, and in the middle of the week, before we got to that second weekend, suddenly COVID-19 was everywhere. And it was, they shut down the basketball season. Tom Hanks and his wife got sick with it and something else happened all in like 24 hours. And it was like that Wednesday, our world changed. And that second weekend, people were listening to this play in an entirely different way. So that when I talked about, for instance, the, uh, the, the, um, the, the, the curve, what am I, what do I, what do, the exponential curve. Uh, we've been, had a sudden uh, uh, lesson in exponential curves over that past 24, 48 hours that it was hitting people in an, in an entirely different way. So in short, I think what's happening with COVID-19 is it's, it is um, reminding us that the secure, uh, Earth as we've known it for all these years is not as predictable as we thought it was going to be. And the, everything can change overnight on a dime and suddenly uh, we're left trying to scratch out a living and figuring out you know, the nature of who it is we are uh, all, all of a sudden and all out of, out of nowhere. So I think if nothing else, we're getting a vision of the feedback loop as I was describing it in the play and, the, and how that impacts the uh, exponential curve. As with COVID-19, one person gets the disease and transmits it to two people who transmit it to four people before that first person has even been diagnosed. So that's a formula for, for a line that looks like this all of a sudden. And that's kind of the same line as when, and we don't know just you know, how um, carbon and methane are going to interact but carbon's one problem and methane is another. And one impacts the other, which impacts the first. And then we go around in this loop that goes faster and faster. Absolutely. And the permafrost releases the methane, which is way more deadly than uh, carbon. It doesn't last as long, but it's, it's way, uh, way bad in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Also, um, the exponential growth of population. You spoke yes. about the 1918 pandemic um, where we lost, was it 50 million people? Um, I think worldwide it might have been 50 million. I don't have the numbers on that. I'm not sure. Either. But the the lesson I think from the the 1918 of uh, what was it the Spanish flu uh, is that it was almost exactly a hundred years ago, just over a, barely over a hundred years ago. And when thing is when something is that far in the past, and we seem to have made it without other wild pandemics in the interim, we forget that those things are actually even possible. We stop planning for them. We disassemble the uh, councils that were in charge of responding to pandemics because maybe they were costing us too much money and suddenly we find ourselves hit with something. So between 1918 uh, and the flu, 1920 and the Great Depression, uh, we're living through um, years that are mostly beyond our living memory and suddenly it's, uh, we're crashing and burning all over the place. Yeah, indeed. Um, I was just looking that the 1918 pandemic um, infected 500 million people, or one third of the world's population at the time, and the number of deaths was about 50 million, yeah, worldwide. 
Yeah. Um, and what's amazing to me when you talk about population and we think about the Earth's carrying capacity and how we've kind of really stretched that up is that um, you had said 99% of the people on Earth, it, you know, that predates 99% of the people that now live on Earth. Right. Um, and certainly those people who were born four or five years prior to 1918 probably didn't have, don't have that much even conscious memory of that event. But, uh, you know, most, most of us have been cruising along fine ever since and with no idea that something like this could hit us all out of, out of the blue like that. Mm -hmm. We need our good Native American elders to help teach us the, <laughs> the spirit about the good spirit world. Yes. If and, we don't learn um, from history, we are condemned to relive it. Yes, ab absolutely. And also in terms of exponential growth, the, the um, increase in carbon, the parts per million is now up over 400 um, parts per million and 415 um, was the last reading I saw and that's up from uh, around the uh, Industrial Revolution. We were at 280 parts per million. So the level that we're at now is the highest that well the last time we were at the level that we're at now there were no humans on earth. So um, it's been it's been, you know, at least uh, uh, 300,000 years probably many more. Wow. I want to give a shout out to Bill McKibben and um, 350.org because that's what that's all about, trying to hold the parts per million of carbon in the air to 350. Uh, and that's, it's a, it's a, it's a battle. But um, as we have, you know, more, uh, more carbon and things warm up, we have more forest fires eradicating the plant life. And and uh, it's just, as you say, the feedback. Loop. Well, it's, it's recent enough that I still remember very recently when they were saying that, well, if it ever hits uh, 400 parts per million, we'll be in trouble. Well, right. we, we hit that maybe 10 years ago and we're up to 415 now. And then they keep moving the goal post backwards so that, well, well, 420, that's a problem or 450, that's a problem. So is this near term human extinction inevitable or will will technology always outrun our maturity <laughs> on the path that we're on now i would have to say it's inevitable uh it what it's, conquering this is a matter of changing our point of view and um learning to think as a group a little more than to think about uh ourselves as individuals um i think we all kind of uh are uh, have have taught I know, I know I've, I've been taught as I grew up is that the idea is to come away with as many things as we can, uh, to, to have those nice cars and go on those great holidays and all of which is going to pump more carbon into the air. Um, so uh, the, our ability to tackle this is going to be dependent on our ability to think as a group and to um, share the burden as a group in coming up with our solutions, giving up a little bit of this or a little bit of that, or uh, pitching in for more solar and less gas, all those, all those issues that um, we Americans enjoy our freedom so much and our liberty to uh, burn and run these things that we, uh, we need to rethink these things. Some good things have been happening. Um, I, I know the Supreme Court won't block a ruling to halt work on the Keystone uh, pipeline. And, and Germany just announced their, the first major economy to announce the phase out both coal and nuclear power. Um, and, and whereas some people, of course, talk about nuclear power as being, you know, clean and, and, and safe. If we just had a way to take care of the, you know, after, you know. Residue. The residue, yeah, yeah yes, that, that big, big problem, big problem there, but um, but I think we we do continue to see. I, I don't want to be you know all gloom and doom because, but it is important that everyone understands how serious a situation we are in, and when you bring up in the show about how you know it was slowly at first and then it you know kind of was first, mm -hmm. you know as we're seeing it, the waters rise in Miami and um, you know from all over uh i i it was i looked it up it was 10 years ago i was telling you the other day for the bcdc in the bay area there's the bay conservation and development commission and they helped host a international competition i think there were 
um, uh, 130 entries over 20 countries or so uh, to about sea level rise, looking particularly at um, the, the biggest um, areas such as the San Francisco Bay Area and the Yangtze River Basin and Chesapeake Bay. And, um, and because in the end, there was the amazing, and also I gave this to um, our producer as well to post in the chat about the um, BCDC Rising Tides competition, because it's the designs of what, this is the thing where technology can really help us and, and our creativity can really help us. These beautiful designs of how to try to uh, manage the sea level rise. And then the, understanding that at some point it's going to be really cool to have an underwater apartment <laughs> you know, because it may be very deeply underwater <laughs> it may be very deeply underwater <laughs> certainly a fair amount of san francisco perhaps without even that. having to rebuild your apartment it will find its way yeah well i'm afraid so i'm afraid yeah. so yeah yeah um i know here in the san francisco barrier we have um uh, Treasure Island, and they're talking about major, uh, they, for years they've been talking about, and they're talking about it again, major development on Treasure Island. And they're taking care of the idea of sea level rise and trying to prepare for that and all the different things that would happen because it's sitting right in the middle of the bay. So anyway, mm -hmm. very interesting, um, interesting uh, problem there. So, um, so are we, the human race, so special that uh, as far as we know, <laughs> That, that God is going to drop in and save us? Yes, yes. You talked about that before, God from the machine. Yeah, there's a, yes. it, I, I'm, as, as a, a longtime theater major, I am reminded of my Greek theater in which they had this thing called the uh, Deus Ex Machina. And every time you hear about that now, they're referring to the end of a bad play or a bad ending for a good play, but an ending which is entirely contrived where the hero has just gotten into so much trouble, one thing after another, that everyone is descending upon him. And the god uh, in the Greek theater would have been like, let's imagine it was a crane, which would drop in and pick up the hero and e expedite him uh, into, into some safe place and be saved by God because he was so noble and so righteous. Um, and uh, I, think, uh, I, I think our modern... God from the machine is the rapture. And we believe that no matter how badly we behave, no matter how much we screw up the planet, that somebody's going to come in and save us at the last minute. And uh, that, you know, that would be nice. To surprise and, Earth audience, to bring the tale to a happy ending. Yeah, that would be <laughs> nice. But I don't think we, I think we were, if, if, if the Bible tells us anything, we're here to be stewards of the Earth. And if we, uh, if we believe in that, then I think, I think we have to plan on fixing our way out of this problem ourselves. If God wants to drop in and help us, I would, God bless, mm -hmm. as it were. Well, uh, absolutely. Um, so let's see, uh, are underground bunkers a solution for near-term extinction? Uh, well, some people think they are. Uh, there, I, I was telling you the, the other day, the, um, apparently a lot of people out of Silicon Valley are buying uh, property in New Zealand. And they and why are, New Zealand? Why New Zealand? Because it's, it's far away. It's the most peaceful country that seems to be far away for, from anyone else who might somehow be the target of a nuclear war. They're uh, nuclear it's, it's probably close enough to Antarctica that the, the weather may stay temperate down there, even if everything else turns into a burning fire. Um, and uh, so, so they, it, it seems to be a relatively safe place. And the idea, the notion is, of if you're rich enough, you can afford some property over there, you can excavate it and build these little underground bunkers. But um, that's, only, that's, that's, that's a solution that's temporary. Uh, it's, it, you know, how many generations, let's say you build, let's say you build out a bunker the size of a football stadium. Um, so you and, and five of your friends might do very well for that first generation. And then that generation, uh, doubles and doubles and, and suddenly, uh, before long you realize, oh, we should have brought in supplies that would last us more than a hundred years. I, you know, it, it ultimately any solution like that whether it's to send 
a rocket ship to the to Proxima Centauri. Um, that rocket ship is a very confined space, and you're planning for generations upon generations to multiply and get into petty fights with each other in the course of the time. So, I don't. I. I I think that sometimes people look at solutions like that as a way for not taking responsibility for what we're doing to the planet at large. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you, you, uh, when we were talking about this, you talked about, what was your word? Um, the schadenfreude, the, the pleasure that one derives from another person's misfortune. Yes. <laughs> I, um, so we don't have the winner takes all. We have to change that winner takes all. Um, yeah, and I think what I what I get into at the end of of the play is that we we all of us and my my character as well has a bit of a reckoning with himself, um, in that he's he's been happy to in the in the the twenty minutes that you saw here to lecture some unknown species about the way they should be behaving. But he realizes in the course of that, that he's done all the things that he's complained about. He's se separated himself off all alone in a bunker of his own with a limited amount of supplies of food and locked everyone else out. And so uh, he has his own reckoning to deal with. We do have a statement and a question from Polly Esther, um, who says, since the majority of world's population has been stuck indoors during this pandemic, the air quality in major cities has cleared up significantly. Significantly, We have no idea what the new normal will be once somehow the virus gets under control, but seeing clear skies in places like Seoul, LA, New Delhi is encouraging. Do you think that environmental groups can potentially help maintain this or do you think pollution will run rampant again with people ignoring responsibility once more? Is there hope for civilization to fight for a cleaner future since we've seen the effects of how harsh and damaging pollution can be these past few months? Go I say ahead. yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, 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 you know, because, because uh, things are happening. In fact, just this week, the House Democrats eyed 2021 with a comprehensive climate action plan. I got information today from Bernie Sanders in terms of, you know, really pushing on the Green New Deal. I know it's, 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 it looks sometimes like we're not doing enough fast enough. And I think right now that is true. But there are a lot of really good environmental groups out there and there are really good things happening. We need to change the political will to make, to make it happen and to, to change our dependence on fossil fuels. And, um, you know, but there are those people that, that, that deny climate. And so how, how, as we're closing, and I'm afraid it's already that time, <laughs> there's so much more we could talk about, but Tim, how do you convince your right-wing friends, the doubters uh, on climate change? What do you say to them? Okay, well, I, I discovered a, a, a line of, of argument that uh, actually worked for me uh, on a couple of occasions, which is, and, and what I find is that, uh, first of all, the doubters, more of them believe than admit they believe. They say they disbelieve, often not because of scientific reasons, but because of social reasons. They need to uh, keep peace within the family, uh, husbands and wives, fathers and children, uh, and, uh, or coworkers. And so, and so there's a social reason sometimes I might adopt a position because it helps me go along and get along. Um, but I've found that when I get into that conversation and somebody says, you know, I really just don't think that the climate is changing, I say, I think you're kidding yourself. And they try to explain their position and I come back at them with the same line. I say, I think you're kidding yourself. And they come back at it again. They try to explain and explain and explain. And then, and, but that little chip away of, I think you're kidding yourself. I think you're kidding yourself. It's not saying, I think you're stupid. It's not saying, I think you're ignorant. It's saying, you know better. You understand this well enough to trick yourself into thinking something different because you have some other need at play here. Um, and I, I had this, that's, this argument with a friend in Phoenix when I was driving through Phoenix on my way to LA. And uh, the next day I got an email from her saying, you know, I, I guess you're right. I, I, I really do think climate change is happening. I just don't think there's anything we can do about it. So I at least got, that got one person to shift in a position. And I think that we forget, or we don't know, most people 
believe that maybe 50, on an average, 54% of Americans believe that there is climate change. And in actuality, from a, a, a survey done in April 19, 19, 2019, 69% uh, of Americans believe in climate change. Right. change. So when we realize that we are in the majority, then we're less hesitant about speaking up, less, less hesitant about expressing some authority in the matter and citing the 98% of scientists who are on that side as well. That's great. I'm so appreciative of that. And um, it, it's definitely a line I'm going to, uh, to use in the future. Good.